Good evening and welcome to the University of Houston. I'm Dan O'Connor. I'm the Interim Dean of the College of Liberal Arts and Social Sciences, the proud home of the Arab American Education Foundation Center for Arab Studies, which is hosting the event tonight. I just wanted to take a minute to uh, recognize that the center is uh, supported uh, very largely by the American, uh, Arab American Education Foundation, both in terms of the center itself and the chair professorship of the director. <coughs> Uh, I also want to thank the Forrest family who supports this particular lecture and the Jews family who supports another endowed professorship affiliated with the center. Uh, welcome to the University of Houston tonight. I'm looking forward to this lecture. The uh, Arab Studies program started as a pretty small program with big aspirations and in support of AAAF and the other donors have really accelerated that and I expect to see big things in years to come. Uh, I do apologize, Dr. Takridi is the director. He's out ill tonight and is unable to make it to the event. Um, without further ado, I want to introduce the, the chair of the Department of History, Dr. Nancy Beck Hill. I am very pleased to follow our, my dean to welcome you tonight and say thank you to the Arab American Educational Foundation for their wonderful generosity to the University of Houston. I was chair six or seven years ago when we hired Abed Takridi and I was blown away by his vision for what this center be could become and have really enjoyed watching it take off and now I find myself chair again and uh, willing to stand in for him to welcome you to the University of Houston. So welcome, we're very glad to have you here and we are just really excited to watch this vision take off and become a, a very important reality in our community. So thank you very much and I will now turn it over to my colleague uh, from the English department to uh, introduce our speaker, Dr. Hassam, Hassam Abu Ella. Good evening and thank you very much for coming. Um, it's an honor to welcome you back to the AAEF Nijad and Zainal Theris uh, Distinguished Lecture. Um, which we have been putting on for several years now and brought prominent experts in various fields related to the study of the Arab world, thanks to the generosity of the Ferris family and the AAEF. And um, uh, we're really happy tonight to be taking first steps toward getting things back to, to, the, to the tradition. Um, Rabia Halam Adin of Lebanese descent uh, was born in Amman, Jordan, and has lived most of his adult life in the exotic foreign country known as California. He began publishing novels written in English at a time when work from or about the Arab world was described as, quote, embargoed literature, end quote, by the prominent literary critic and activist Edward Said. That is, this is what was going on in the 1990s. Said meant that a latent hostility toward the Middle East region had resulted in an attitude on the part of editors and publishers toward Arabic literature and translation, and other material that directly presented the Arab point of view. Writing in English and constructing narratives that combine the most immediate concerns of readers in the United States with urgent Arab world issues, al Dean's work had an immediate impact, especially his debut novel, Cool Aids, which engaged both the AIDS crisis in California and the Lebanese Civil War. In his subsequent career, the impact of his writing has grown even larger with the, publications of no uh, with the publication of novels, including The Hakawati in 2008, An Unnecessary Woman in 2014, The Angel of History in 2016, and his most recent work, just published this fall, The Wrong End of the Telescope, set in a refugee camp on the island of Lesbos, and centering a Lebanese humanitarian aid doctor estranged from her Arab world roots. A consistent strategy in all these works is an adroit ability to combine the concerns of the author's two regions and show how they might be seen as one, or at least in conversation. Perhaps unusually for such a bold voice, al writing has garnered extensive accolades. His awards include, but are not limited to, because it would be here all night, and I'm the third introducer, so I'm cutting it short. Uh, but they do include the Guggenheim Fellowship, the John Dos Passos Prize for Literature, the Arab American Book Award, the Lambda Literary Award, and the Rome Prize. His nominations include the National Book Award, the National Book Critics Circle Award, and the Andrew Carnegie Medal for Excellence. 
His novels have been translated into Swedish, French, German, Dutch, Italian, Polish, Spanish, Arabic, Bosnian, Norwegian, basically all the languages, um, and uh, have achieved bestseller status in countries across the globe. In addition to his pro prodigious career in novel writing, Alamedin is an accomplished painter, a prominent essayist, and a Twitter influencer. Um, after a, a pandemic long delay and much anticipation, we've been trying for months to get him here, it is a pleasure to welcome back to Houston, Ruby Halamadi. Thank you so much. Every time I get introduced, I always think, are they talking about me? It doesn't sound like it. Anyway, uh, thank you, thank you so much for coming here. This is amazing. Uh, and after being, you know, quarantined for so long, Coming to an event like this is almost orgasmic. <laughs> it's probably as close to sex as I'll get with one. <laughs> you know, at least there are people in the room. <laughs> Again, uh, thank you so much for coming. Uh, thank you to the University of Houston, to the Arab Studies Foundation, to uh, Nijad and Zainab Faris. Uh, I love you. you know, feed me. <laughs> so, uh, let me start by saying, I, I don't like to call these things lectures, uh, because I don't do lectures very well. I do a talk, maybe even a meaningful chat. So maybe we should call this the, you know, Nishat and Zainab Faris Distinguished Chat. The weird artist Paul Clay used to say that drawing is just taking the line for a walk. I love that, again, taking the line for a walk. So my talk is, is, is taking an idea for a walk, uh, without a leash. Let me call this a stroll, or maybe a, a promenade. I promise to keep this short, um, I may mean, not stick to the point. I assume that anyone who has read my work knows that I cannot stick to a point, or stick to anything for that matter, but I will try to keep it short. Why? Well, because every time I talk politics in, in this country, I notice that people's faces go blank. It never fails. I come from Lebanon, a culture where citizens not only talk politics, they never shut up about it. It's a national obsession. Over here, we have talk shows with Oprah and Ellen, stars with only the first names talking to celebrities. In Lebanon, there are three hour talk shows about what the government is doing and whether what happened in Tel Aviv, in Tehran, or Iran would affect the price of wheat in Beirut. Over here, good manners suggest that you not bring up politics at a dinner party. In Lebanon, that may be, it would be considered a terrible dinner. If there are not at least two three, or three major political arguments, maybe a flying plate or two, the dinner might be considered boring. Now, I might be exaggerating, and of course I'm generalizing. There are Lebanese who don't care about politics, and many Americans who do. The situation has changed quite a bit these days, but when I first arrived in this country, and for a long time thereafter, politics was thought of as tedious. If two people were talking and one uttered the word political, the other nods off in Buffalo in response. Uh, let's call the symptom political narcolepsy. So of course, I decide to do a talk on the political in literature. Don't you dare sleep. <laughs> For as long as I can remember, I've been told that political novels are bad novels, or at least not very good. Even back in high school in Lebanon, our English teacher, a lovely man hailing all the way from New Zealand, explained to us, his less than eager students, that political literature is not very good because it is didactic literature. They, that did not mean that we shouldn't read it after all that and form was on the syllabus that year. Political works serve a purpose and can benefit society in various ways, he said. But if we wanted to read literature, with a capital L, this ephemeral thing that moves not just mind, but souls and mountains. We should look for writers like Shakespeare, whose writing was artistic and not political. 
Now, I was 14 or 15 at the time. Yet even then, I had an inkling that his position was tenuous at best, or to put it in words I would have used at the time, such bullshit. I figured that out even though I was yet to read any of Shakespeare's history plays. I don't think any sane man would ever suggest Richard III or Henry V on political, or Julius Caesar, or Macbeth for that matter. But that year, we were reading Romeo and Juliet, a love story, which according to our teacher was not political. I am Lebanese, so of course I saw it as political. Romeo and Juliet belonged to two families that couldn't stand each other, that wouldn't speak to each other. We had families like that in the mountain village I came from. Some people in the village voted for the Jumblad family in every election, and the other voted for the Arslan family. Even though the entire village was of the same sect, mostly the same class, what clan they belonged to, and who they were loyal to, determined everything. I saw the play as political. Hell, I even imagined what would happen if a Palestinian girl fell in love with an Israeli boy. Oh boy. <clears throat> I would encounter that argument that if a novel is political, it was less than, that it could never be as good as a literary novel all through my life as a writer, particularly here in the US. That position was promulgated by many established writers, by quite a few literary magazines and journals, and across the board in MFA programs. What was not always stated outright, though, usually an underlying assumption, is that political no novels were not literary, that literature should rise above the pettiness of politics, that art should be separate from politics. I have had, heard it said many a time, the province of art is the human condition. Writing about the human condition is the only subject a literary writer should deal with. I have said it in interviews, on panels, streamed it from rooftops, so I will say it here once more. Writing about the human condition is a political act. It might be one of the, the greatest political acts. So. In 2016, I attended the Association of Writers and Writing Programs Conference in Los Angeles. I must admit here that I'm not a big fan of conferences in general, and I don't do well in large crowds, which was why I stood behind her and allowed you all to come in before me. It's not exactly a phobia, but it's close enough. And I'm not fond of writing conferences in particular. As an aside, I, I remember attending the Jaipur Literary Festival, which I believe is the biggest lit festival of them all. On my first day, I walked by a group of festival volunteers as they were being trained and the trainer stood in front of the group and was explaining loudly that what they should do in case of a stampede. I spent three days freaking out completely. I mean, they have four million attendees and I'm just one person, a stampede. I still shudder still just thinking about it. I mentioned this to point out that I was feeling, I said I feel anxious at festivals, which is why I might not always be that diplomatic when I'm there. In any case, I attended the AWP conference and I wasn't exactly happy about it. I was booked on a panel called Politics and Literary Fiction. Now, I do consider my, my work to be political, so I wasn't exactly shocked to be chosen for that panel. But I was promoting my novel, An Unnecessary Woman, about a reclusive 72 year old woman who translates literary books that no one reads and hardly leaves her apartment. It might be the least overtly political of my novels. Yet there I was on a panel with, mind you, two other hyphenated Americans and a Brit. I might not have been shocked, but I was, shall we say, a bit weirded out. It was a large audience, and then I began to notice during the Q&A that the reason an unnecessary woman was considered political was because it was set in Beirut. Because, you know, I was commenting on the plight of women in a terribly patriarchal culture and all that. Had I played the novel in New York City or Houston and kept the same themes, it wouldn't be political because, you know, why? Well, because we don't have really live in a patriarchal culture over here. No. 
So I slowly became less weirded out and returned to my natural state, grumpy. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. Many of the questions from the audience were to my pet peeve of literature should be political, and I told the audience off. I said, the only way you can think that politics is separate from literature is if the political system is working for you. There, I said it. Again. Maybe I should have said it more diplomatically. I must have said a few things that were undiplomatic. The friends who were there in the audience said something about blanched faces and horrified gasps. I blame my anxiety, see, for <laughs> Which is exacerbated by writing conferences. Now, of course, things have changed since I started writing some 20 years ago and changed drastically since I was in high school in Dublin. People seem to be able to talk politics these days. Some over here won't shut up about it. I guess we're becoming more Lebanese. <laughs> Political novels are more common, so common that in fact we might even call it a genre. A friend of mine suggests that writers these days are indoctrinated with the opposite of what I was, that being political is of utmost importance. He loves to say that art simply isn't very good at politics. If an artist wants to make a difference, they should go into actual politics. Putting aside for a moment whether writing could be an effective tool for change, he is right that we seem to praise political writing more these days, particularly writing that deal with, me, with, we, with what we call identity politics. I heard that two po poets serving on the jury for the National Book Award recently were having a discussion where one poet was strongly supporting a book and the other opposing it. The latter did not appreciate poems dealing with aesthetics. Beautiful poems did not move her. Political poems did. Now, I think that's an, inord an inordinately stupid comment. As if the beautiful and the political are at different ends of the spectrum. Just stupid. A poet who doesn't appreciate beauty makes no sense to me. Aesthetics is my bread and butter. It's all the food groups and ice cream. But let me take the statement that what's beautiful is inherently not political a bit further. Suppose we have a poem about a blooming flower. How gorgeously the petals unfurl, how the play of light affects said unfurling. The poet who makes beautiful poems might tell us that this isn't a political poem. But what if it, what if it is read by a woman, say, in Lubbock, Texas? who sees the poem as a metaphor for claiming one's power. She, let, she, she decides to register in a community, community college, gets her real estate license, leaves for her good-for-nothing husband, and starts her own company. Can we now consider the flower, the flower poem political? What if it is read by a young gay boy who sees it as a metaphor for transformation and crawling? He comes out of the closet and, I don't know, starts a local gay rights group in some farm town in Virginia or some village in Jordan. Is the flower poem then political? This is an old, the intent versus interpretation argument. We usually decide that it is the intent of the poem that determines whether it is political or not. I'm not sure that's the case. My work might be political, but when I sit down to write, Politics is rarely on my mind. Like most writers, I'm worried about how to make a sentence work, how to move from one paragraph to the next, how to make the story flow, how to bring the characters to life. I can't tell you what the intent of the writer of the flower poem, particularly since we made her out just as an example. I can only look at the result. And for me, a work of art doesn't exist without a receiver, viewer, or reader. A painting is just an object if no one sees it, but it becomes a great painting or a work of art when seen. Does a novel exist without a reader, a reader who is its interpreter? A book is just a book. Can how a book is read make it political? One of the great novels of our time is Olga Costa Master and Margarita, a magical, satirical, dark comedy that defies categorization. If you haven't read it, go out now and get it. 
It was banned in the Soviet Union and caused the writer all kinds of problems. Now, the actual story, a depo visiting a small town in Russia, is not overtly political. Allegorically, it is a dev devastating attack on the governing powers. A number of novels written under criminally, criminally repressive regimes do the same. I understand that most likely Bulgakov's intent was to write a political novel. But how can we be sure of that when we read it? If his, his, if his intent was only to write a beautiful novel, would it still be political? Can how a book is read make it political? That might be too philosophical a question for this promenade. On the other hand, since I was a writer, since I as a writer have little control as to how my work is interpreted, I desperately believe that my intent is what matters. I find it difficult to unspool the threads of intent, interpretation, or limits. But what I would like to unspool in this talk is why we seem to consider political writing to be separate from the literary kind. Or in the case of the silly poet, why political and beautiful must oppose each other. When I was thinking about this talk, I asked various friends what they considered a political novel and what they thought was not. Their replies were enlightening. A French friend, Philippe, said he disliked political novels. He then added, the Count of Mont Monte Cristo is the most savage attack of France's 1840s social, judicial, and political system that I can think of. But is it a political novel? No. And it is, so he said with a French accent, no. <laughs> I found that curious. How could a novel that attacks a political system be considered apolitical? The answer to that seems to be that for many people, a novel that's political has to be overtly so, where the message overpowers everything. Philippe made sure to explain to me that my novels were not political, even though I certainly thought they were. The subject came up in a conversation I was having with the magnificent Australian writer Richard Flanagan in a, in a Gaudi bar in Madrid, of all places. I'm paraphrasing here, of course. Richard suggested that writers need not concern themselves with politics, that our ideal is to emulate Franz Kafka, lock ourselves in a room and write whatever moves us. I agree with that sentiment, of course, but had he said Proust instead of Kafka, it would have made more sense to me. I mean, really, I consider Kafka one of our great writers, and his work is certainly most political. Sorry, I get lost in this. Um, what is strange is that Flanagan's novel are all outstanding and unequivocally political. His novel, Gould's Book of Fish, is about a convict who falls in love with a black woman and tells the history of Australia's conception. His Booker, Booker Prize winning the novel, The Narrow Road of the Deep North, is the story of the death railway which was built by Japanese war camp prisoners. Hell, he has a novel titled The Unknown Terrorist. Basically, many don't consider his work to be political because his novels deal with more than just politics, or to use a more common term, rises above politics. The characters are well developed, the plot gripping, and the language exquisite. I consider them very much so, obviously. Does any book rise above politics? Here's a quote from probably the most well-known political writer, George Orwell. In our age, there's no such thing as keeping out of politics. All issues are political issues, and politics itself is a mass of lies, evasions, folly, hatred, and schizophrenia. I like Orwell. For as long as I can remember, manifestly political novels have always around some, aroused some degree of suspicion. Milan Kundera once dismissed Orwell's 1984 as political thought disguised as a novel. In a devastating review, Whitaker Chambers said that Ayn Rand's colossal and interminable actor struck can be called a novel only by devaluing the term. Until a few years ago, the mantra that great art is not political was everywhere. 
Yet the examples offered as political novels were always patently bad novels, <coughs> where the political agenda overpowered everything in the book. I mean, Atlas Shrugged, really? That one is such an awful novel by any standard. Its agenda is so blatant and blatantly idiotic. As an aside, I've had at least one person tell me that it might not be a good novel, but he had learned a lot from its philosophy. Anyone who claims that Rand is a philosophy has not read philosophy. <laughs> the philosophy of E. Wee Herman is more rigorous than this <laughs> kind of that of Ayn Rand. I know what you are, but what am I? <laughs> as much as I like Orwell's 1984 in animal form, they're not good novels. Basically, the examples offered as political novels are always agenda-driven ones, books that cross the lines, that lacks subtlety. It's not a coincidence that the majority of Ayn Rand fans are boys who came across their work as teenagers, when furious hormones drove away any hint of subtlety. Are agenda-driven novels always bad? Well, I'm not a fan. I think most novels that hit you over the head with a two-by-four are not very good. That's not to say they can't be effective, even necessary at times. The jungle of Ted Upton Sinclair's horrific expose of the plight of immigrant workers in the Chicago meatpacking industry prompted Theodore Roosevelt to establish the forerunner of the FDA. Is the jungle a good novel? I loved it when I read it as a young man and certainly was effective, but I don't think it's a very good. There are many other examples of manifestly political novels that weren't very good, but were effective at proselytizing. Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin fired up the avalanche shoes movement. Again, I'd like you to notice that even when we talk, we're talking about campaigning political novels, nobody offers as example the truly great ones. Those that proselytize and are magnificent. Chinua Achebe's anti-colonial masterpiece, Things Fall Apart, or Solzhenitsyn's Gula Chronicle, One Day in the Life of Ivan Denisovich. Denisovich. For many, one of literature's greatest work of fiction, Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness, isn't considered political, despite its total lack of subtlety in its political message. So it seems that for many critics, a great political novel isn't political, and a bad one is. A political novel can only be bad. Now, most novels have things that are most novels have themes rather than agenda, and almost always more than just one. Yet for many readers, political themes are usually glossed over, and there are many reasons for that, including some, in my opinion, that go directly into the heart of problems, in the heart of the problems this country we live in. Once, when he was accepting an award in an East European city, Philip Roth told the audience in his acceptance speech, and once again I'm paraphrasing here since unfortunately I've been unable to find the exact quote. Roth said, this is as strange as it might sound, he envied Eastern European writers since the act of writing for them seemed more urgent, a matter of life and death at times. I know he didn't mean that he'd be willing to change places with writers living under censorship, severe repression, and or murderous dictatorships. I assume he believed that writing under these conditions forced writers to be more creative, their work becoming more imperative and indispensable. I wholeheartedly agree with him. Many of my favorite writers are Eastern European and South Americans or Africans. Writers who live under restrictive or dangerous governments. It is true that there is an urgency to their work, but I, what I find troublesome is the inference that for American writers, life is easier and more comfortable. So our work reflects that. The problem, and I hope that this is something that we all understand these days, is that life is more comfortable for some Americans, and not for all of us. As an Arab living in this country, my life is certainly not easier. For an African American who constantly worries about being shot on a whim, life is not some piece of cake. For minorities, for immigrants, for queer, for all those living in the margins of the dominant culture, for those living below the poverty line, life isn't always easy. 
When writers belonging to the margins of the dominant culture write about their daily life, what is it like for them to live in their country, their work is considered political. When writers belonging to the center of the dominant culture write about their daily lives, what it's like for them to live in their country, their work is considered not political. Again, I do agree with, with Rob. I think African Americans, immigrants, Uyghurs, Asian Americans, and Latinos are writing novels that are urgent and important because, let's face it, lives are more, are more at stake. Many have more skin in the game, so to speak. And yes, that work is political as well. What I would like to state here is that novels from my writers that are part of the dominant culture are political as well. As George Orwell wrote, no book is genuine free, genuinely free from political bias. The opinion that art should have nothing to do with politics is itself a political attitude. Let me give an example. If your country is raining bombs on another country, and you choose to write about a couple getting a divorce in Minneapolis, that's a political decision. This doesn't mean the novel would be good or bad, urgent or not. I'm just saying it's a political decision. If you write about a stockbroker trying to make peace with his children while your government is placing immigrant children in cages, that's a political attitude. Some writers would say that the act of writing is in and of itself a political act. So of course, the choice of what to write about falls into that category. But the content, they say, doesn't have to be so. Now, I'm not sure that I can say that every novel is political, but most of what is considered not is. Let's look at some classics. There are some, not many, who consider Dickens a political writer. His novels use character and narrative to draw the reader's attention to some social ill and to galvanize efforts to remedy it. Very few would consider Jane Austen a political writer, even though her novels use character and narrative to draw attention, to draw the reader's attention to to some social ill and to galvanize efforts to remedy it. Yes, it's true. Austen is more subtle than Dickens, which is why I prefer her work. But the main reason she's not considered political is because she's writing about the gentry, those who are part of the dominant culture. And Dickens is write about, writing about poor people who are not. Neither Austen nor Dickens write agenda-driven novels, but that doesn't mean that their work is any less political. Jane Austen disturbs the pretensions of England's dominant culture with the best of them. She does it with delicacy and subtlety, but she does it nonetheless. Her novels are political, just like Dickens, just like, say, Voltaire's. Austen wanted to change her culture. She was a revolutionary. Why is it so difficult for us to see her and her work as political? Tim O'Brien's novel, The Things They Carry, deals with the experience of American soldiers in Vietnam. It is critical of the Vietnam War and considered a political novel. John Updike supported the war in Indochina. I haven't read all his novels, but I don't remember him writing about the effect of Vietnam on his characters or on the communities he wrote about. If your country is blanking, blanket bombing another, if an entire generation of its young men are killing and being killed or getting traumatized in a foreign country, and the novel you're writing is about an idyllic suburbia where detention is a husband considered him cheating on his wife, how is that not a political novel? How is a novel that exalts a way of life, any way of life, not political. A novel about a doctor who moves to a small town and is beaten up by drunks upon a arrival is considered not. But an immigrant moves to a small town and gets attacked is. Let me state this clearly. If a novel reinforces the dominant, the dominant society's values, that culture will not think of the novel as political. If it doesn't, it is. If a novel 
threatens how the dominant culture views itself, the dominant culture considers it political. Now please, I don't want to suggest that we should tell writers what to write and what not to. Just because Updike writes about stultifying suburbia doesn't necessarily make his work less interesting or less valuable. I certainly would not want him to write about things that do not interest him just because he might be more urgent. For example, I would not want him to write a novel about an 18-year-old Egyptian-American boy and other terrorist. That was a joke, people. <laughs> I mean, I would support his right to do so, but I would not want him to. Turn up like wrote a book about an 18-year-old Egyptian-American boy and called a terrorist. A novelist can write about anything, and it can be urgent, it can be brilliant, and most likely, it is also political. I don't have to tell you that the level of political discourse in this country has dropped off dramatically. If a political thought or position cannot be stated in one tweet, it can no longer exist. We shout at each other across various social media platforms and consider that the apex of policy. I would like to suggest that political discourse in our country has been disintegrated for a while. I believe this helps people in power. What has also been apparent to me is how often the abstract noun politics and the adjective political are used pejoratively. We say things like someone's playing politics. Calling someone political is a thing to say they're a snake. Whenever the Supreme Court comes out with a decision that some faction doesn't like, the response is usually, when did the court become so political? For the record, the court has always been political. Politics is its reason for being. Politics and political mean different things to different people, and for most of us, we rarely use these words for anything good. I won't talk here about how the limiting of meaning of these words help the powerful remain in power. I will leave that to your imagination. What I'm interested in is this teeny tiny place of our world we call literature. How the fact that we think of politics as somewhat detrimental to art is limiting our literature. And how so few of us can agree on what constitutes a political novel. As I said, in preparation for this talk, I asked a number of friends some questions. I'm a writer, not an academic. When I do when I do research, I basically talk to my friends. <laughs> if if I want to do deep pre-research, I, I ask acquaintances to. <laughs> if I want to do research out of the box, I talk to my cousin, a crazy cousin in Beirut. <laughs> I ask my friends, do you think political novels in general are bad? And if so, why? What would make a novel political in another not? Can art and politics be separated? And if so, should they be? For the most part, most agree that political novels are bad. That a novel is political when the message is heavy-handed. I wasn't surprised that quite a few considered novels like The Handmaid's Tale and Fahrenheit 451 not political. Or as one friend noted, not very political. Even though they have a strong message, and dare I say, a heavy-handed message. The explanations were given were that the novels offered more than just a message. Same of what was said about the Count of Monte Cristo. This might seem reasonable on the surface, but we only know we all know that only atrocious novels offer just a message. Any novel worth its salt interweaves many themes and engages readers on different levels. What most of my friends seem to be saying. If I liked a novel, then it isn't political. If I didn't, it is. I consider most novels to be political because I think politics is a thing that happens organically in, in human social systems, from the family up. Humans are inherently political in their interactions. Therefore, writing about the human condition is political. I do understand that my definition of the word political is so broad that it becomes, in essence, meaningless. But I find how our culture defines the word to be so limited that it renders it meaningless as well. Let's consider for a moment the hot topic du jour, identity-based political literature, and what is defined as such. If I write a novel about an Arab family living in the US, going about their daily lives, 
loving and hating each other. I mean, you. All I have to do is write about my family. <laughs> Would it be considered identity-based, you know, identity-based? Would it depend on whether I include an incidence or two of discrimination? What if my family were Chinese? What if I were white? As I mentioned earlier, I feel that it would be considered not political if it isn't a threat to how the dominant culture views itself. If Colson Whitehead writes a novel about a black man's life, is it identity politics? If John Updike writes a novel about a white man's life, is it not identity politics? On the New York Times Book Review podcast recently, the writer Thomas Mallon and the paper's book editor Pamela Paul were discussing Jonathan Franzen's latest novel. They were so grateful for how Franzen keeps politics out of his fiction. Two things quickly come to mind when I heard that. One, why is keeping politics out of fiction either a good or a bad thing? And, more troublesome, how is writing about an all-white character not by definition identity-based politics. I'm not trying to suggest that writing about an African-American family is better or worse than writing about a white family. I don't think a novel with an all-white cast is any less political than one with all Chinese or an all-Arab cast. One of my all-time favorite writers is Alice Munro, whose short stories are miraculous at times. She's Canadian, and the characters in her stories are almost exclusively white, and hardly ever encounter any other, uh, any other kind of Canadians. When your country is multi-ethnic and has been since its inception, and you ignore every other race, how is that not identity-based political fiction? When she writes about a poor woman from, from the country struggling in a big city where others are indulging in a never-ending capitalist orgy, how is that not political? Yet when she won the Nobel Prize, a writer friend was ecstatic. Finally, she said, the Nobel is recognizing a non-political writer. Alice Munro writes great literature, and it is political. In his review of the novel John Henry Days, John Updike praised the young Colson Whitehead, particularly his first novel, The Intuitionist. But then added one thing that boggled my mind. He said that the central character of the novel behaved like any regular white man. So why did he have to be black? <laughs> the exact quote is, the central character need not be black at all. His discontent might just as well be that of a young white or Asian American of literary bent. His educational advantages and his relatively race-blind milieu of pop culture deprived him of the claim that black characters from the slave narratives on traditionally exert upon the American conscious the heroism that persecution and disadvantage impose. Of course, that is horrifically racist. Uh, how something so stupidly racist was allowed to run in the New Yorker still stuns me all these years later. But the question that I'm interested in, though, is had Colson made his character more black, whatever that means, would Updike have considered it more political? Does the character have to be stereotypical or not for it to be considered identity-based political fiction? If an African-American writes a novel that shows a heroic fight against persecution and a disadvantage, is she writing a political novel and not, if not? In another New Yorker review, John Updike raised the spell by the gay writer Andrew Hollinghurst. Updike loved the novel. But then, as was his wont, he added another wounding take. He claimed to be not totally invested in the characters' relationships because somehow they seemed less interesting than straight ones. There was more at stake in heterosexual relationships, he said, because the sex can possibly lead to reproduction. Think about that. If you can't have biological children by having intercourse, your relationship isn't that meaningful. Now, is a novel about gay love identity-based political fiction? 
We know that our tax novels aren't considered, considered our political that. We know that our tax novels aren't considered identity-based political fiction. Does a white man behaving as a white man, sorry, does a white man behaving as a white man should make the work not political? Does a straight man having sex with a woman and she, oh my God, gets pregnant, does that mean that the novel isn't identity-based? What is going on here? To find out, let's talk about the greatest of art, its highest form, the Marvel Cinematic Universe. That's a joke, people. That is a joke. Come on. <laughs> when the comics meet the, the new Thor, a woman, instead of choosing to repeat the familiar hunky blonde man trope, the fandom exploded with patriotic rebellion. This could not be, we won't accept this. The dominant theme was that Thor had become political. When Thor was male, it wasn't political, but when she's male, it is. That a Pakistani Muslim girl, Miss Marvel, that Pakistani Muslim girl, Miss Marvel, is political, goes without saying. But my favorite uproar is the Captain America has gone black. When, after the comic and comical death of the original, Marvel made an African-American man, Captain America, various fans went insane. And of course, one of the first responses was, why would you turn Captain America political? When a character with a name like Captain America is created to fight the Nazis, created to help young, recruit young men and women into the armed forces, to defend the values of the country bearing his name. When that character is a white man, it is not political. But when he's black, obviously it is. I will not mention the fact that the new Superman, son of the old Superman, is gay. And the reaction, because, well, that's DC and not Marvel, so. <laughs> <laughs> now, obviously, I'm giving this talk because denigrating works by calling them political rankles me. I keep thinking that dismissing writers for being political is similar to telling Lebron James that he should shut up and stick to basketball. When Thomas Madden and Pamela Paul suggest that it's wonderful that Franzen avoids politics, I feel they're telling the rest of us to shut up and stick to novels about couples, couples divorcing in many other. I know that this is my issue, and boy do I have issues. But there's a constant nagging in the back of my head. I hear daddy and mommy telling the kids to play with these dogs here and not disturb them while they stomp on everyone else and crush the world. For the benefit of the kids, of course. Mommy and daddy should be able to exterminate the entire population overseas. Should be able to raise money by incarcerating, say, 10% of the population, Basically, you do whatever they want, and you could, you kids should play in the little corner over there. I feel that writers are being admonished to stay in our lanes, to avoid writing about anything that might upset the status quo. Just this morning, I read that a state senator in this state, a Matt Krause, has drawn out a list of 850 books that could make students feel discomfort and is demanding that school districts across the state report whether any of these books are in their classrooms or libraries. Whenever I come across something like this, my first reaction is to assume it is satire. But no, it takes me a minute to realize it's not. Krauss wants to make sure that students do not read any books that could cause them guilt, anguish, or any form of psychological distress because of their race or sex. I don't care whether something is coming from the right or the left. But, that I, but the idea that a book is not supposed to cause any psychological distress is such hogwash. To put it mildly, if a book doesn't make me feel discomfort, why even bother? For crying out loud, even bad romance novels could cause some discomfort. I mean, will he commit or won't he? <laughs> that causes me discomfort. Is she going to pick the right one or the wrong one? I mean, no, seriously, even the bachelorette has, has some discomfort. <laughs> Literature is never safe. 
and great literature is threatening, whether that threat is conscious or not. I hate this separation of novels by calling them political or not. I divide all novels into two ways, good novels and bad novels. I get tired of having to listen to people saying they hate political novels after reading a bad one. With few exceptions, a novel is bad if it's heavy-handed, if it's about one agenda and little else, whether that agenda is political or not. With few exceptions, a novel is good or can be if it has many threads and is about many things, and most of them are undefinable. I get tired of hearing writers talking about how identity politics is either hurting literature or reviving it. Identity-based political novels have been around for as long as a novel has. It is neither good nor bad in and of itself. It's bad when it's bad, it's good when it's good. I'm tired of readers saying that non-political fiction is more universal. That's wrong by definition. I mean, something is either universal or not. It can't be more so. Something can't be universal if it affects only you and your neighbors, if only you and your suburban development. The dominant old culture always likes to think of itself as universal. It isn't. I was told recently that when interviewers asked the great Toni Morrison whether her work was universal, she replied that it wasn't. She considered her work to be grounded in African-American traditions. I agree with her. Jonathan Franzen's work is grounded in white European traditions. Neither is exactly universal. And they are both political. Saying that some of us can enjoy a novel and learn from it doesn't make it universal. I'm tired of writers trying to explain that one writer, say, Cheever or Monroe, deals with issues that are universal, whereas James Baldwin is more political or more dated, or fill in the blank. What fiction is universal? I can just imagine going up to a prisoner being tortured in Abu Ghraib and say, here, read this short story by John Cheever, which is every human on earth can identify with. God, people, I, what should I do? I mean, should I do it with dancing? This is a funny joke. Wow. <laughs> there are seven billion people on this earth, and almost none of them have read Hubbard. What's universal? What percentage of the seven billion have read Proust, Baldwin, what have you? Universal has no meaning, like political. So yes, it tranquils me when some things are arbitrarily considered less than another because we deem it political. When the New Yorker, in its issue right after September 11, asked various writers to elaborate on their experiences in reaction to the disaster. Almost all wax lyrical about the national grief, the greatness of New York, the irrepressible American spirit. Susan Sontag, Gloria Sontag, began her piece with, let's by all means grieve together, but let not be stupid together. She then went ahead and, and said, and say, called it what it is, or called the bullshit bullshit, telling us in no uncertain terms to take the blinders off. She was quivered by everyone for it. Nowadays, you hear a lot of people saying how amazing that piece was, but at the time, any support of it was muffled by the uproar of anger against her. And of course, many of the responses were, how dare she bring politics into this? As if politics can possibly be excluded from such an act. One of the many pearls that stand out for me about that piece in the magazine was this. She wrote, a lot of thinking needs to be done, and perhaps is being done in Washington and elsewhere, about the ineptitude of American intelligence and counterintelligence, about options available to American policy, particularly in the Middle East, and about what constitutes a smart program of military defense. But the public is not being asked to bear much of the burden of reality. Let me repeat this. The public is not being asked to bear much of the burden of reality. I'll ask this here, just pose the question. Does the public consider a work to be political when that work, that novel, painting, poem, ask the public to bear the burden of reality. 
with reality make the public feel discomfort. A great no novel is almost always political because one of its main concerns is usually political. If we are honest about what we mean by it, for those of us on the periphery of the dominant culture, the political messages might be more urgent because there's more at stake, but they aren't necessarily any less subtle or any less integrated in the main theme than novels written by those writers who fit more easily into the culture, no matter what the text says. Most novels, if not all, are political. You just have to consider whether they are good novels or bad novels. I will end this with a poem by a wonderful young poet I love. I Wake Up by Jameson Fitzpatrick. I woke up and it was political. I made coffee and the coffee was political. I took a shower and the water was. I walked down the street in short shorts and they bought my tank top and they were political. The walking and the shorts and the beefcake screamed so three of the man posing in a G-string. I forgot my sunglasses and later on the train. That was political when I studied every handsome man in the car. Who I thought was handsome was political. I went to work at the university and everything was very obviously political. The department and the institution. All the cigarettes I smoked between classes were political where I threw them when I went through. I was blonde and it was political. So was the difference between blonde and blonder. I had long hair and it was political. I shaved my head and it was. That I didn't know how to grieve when another person was killed in America was political. And it was political when America killed another person. Who they were and what color and gender and who I am in relation. I couldn't think about it for too long without feeling the helplessness, like childhood. I was a child, and it was political. Being a boy who was bad at it. I couldn't catch, and so the ball became political. My mother read to me almost every night, and the conditions that enabled her to do so were political. That my father's money was new was political. That it was proving something. Someone called me a faggot, and it was political. I called myself a faggot, and it was political. How difficult my, felt, my life felt relative to how difficult it was, was political. I thought I could become a writer, and it was political that I could imagine it. I thought I was not political, not a political poet, and still my imagination was political. It had been this whole time I was asleep. Thank you so much.